today we'll be doing the current affairs for the 22nd of March. Okay. Now, the first topic that we'll be discussing is recently in China, a plane crashed, uh, killing all the 132 people on board it. So what were the reasons for this crash? It has not been realized yet because the black box which stores the data of the flight before it crashed has still not been found yet. However, we shall see some cases of recent crashes and what were the reasons for it. Okay. Uh, also, we'll discuss the Indo-Pacific in detail a little because the Australian President says that, I mean the Australian Prime Minister says that the condition of Indo-Pacific should never reach the condition of Ukraine right now. Okay. Now, what is this Indo-Pacific and what is the importance of Indo-Pacific for India? We'll discuss that. You know, Supreme Court, it has said that the deadline for filing for COVID relief, it should be around six months. Okay. The Supreme Court has negated the government's argument that the deadline for filing of COVID compensation should be about four weeks and has said that it should be around six months. We should also discuss the Padma Awards, though not in detail, exercise limite. These are from prelims perspective, including this and this. Okay, we'll discuss even section 144 a little in detail. So these four topics are very important today. Now, first thing, plane crashes around the world. You can see the number of uh, plane crashes around the world in the last 10 years. There are so many of them. And even the Malaysian Airlines, which no one has been able to find, uh, even this was one of those uh, issues. Now, a China Eastern Airlines Boeing 737 with 132 people on board crashed in the hills of southern China. This is the country's worst air tragedy in more than a decade. The aircraft, according to authorities, was cruising at an altitude of 8,800 meters with a speed of 845 kilometers per hour before a steep and sudden descent a little over an hour after its takeoff from the Kunming airport and a little over halfway through its journey. Prime Minister Modi also said that he was deeply shocked and saddened to learn about the crash of the passenger flight MU5735 with 132 people on board. Now, why is this a problem? Unlike the other issues, where there were problems either at the point of takeoff or at the point of descent or at the point of landing. In this uh, aircraft, the aircraft was cruising at an altitude of 8,800 meters. And all of a sudden, it started losing its altitude and it nosedived. This abrupt fall, this is known as a nosedive. Okay, because it is not a proper descent. Rather, it is an abrupt fall, like as though someone you know, ties up the wings of a bird and it suddenly falls out of the air. It just drops. That is the nose type. Okay. The cause of the crash is not known yet. The rescuers are still looking for the black box. Now, what is the black box for a plane? This is the most resilient part of the plane and this contains important information from the cockpit regarding what went wrong and what was the reason for the crash to happen. The black box contains information from instruments and sounds from the cockpit itself. Cockpit is the place where the pilots sit. Okay. The engine was a twin engine, single ale Boeing 737. What is a single ale uh, plane? It means that there is only one pathway in the middle and there will be seats, three seats, three seats to the other side. Okay, seats over here. Is one of the world's most popular planes for short and medium haul flights. We need to see that this particular flight is one of the most important flights and hence this case becomes all the more important. You need to be able to investigate and find the issues for its fall. Earlier, an Ethiopian airline 737 MAX bound for Nairobi crashed minutes after takeoff in March 2019, killing all 157 people on board. Also, a 737 MAX flown by Indonesian budget carrier Lion Air flying from Jakarta on a domestic flight crashed 13 minutes after takeoff, killing all 189 passengers and crew on board in 2018. However, there was something problematic with the 737 MAX. The 737 MAX version was grounded worldwide after these two fatal crashes. So after these crashes happened, China was one of the first countries to ground airlines and it was the last country 
to approve this airlines again even after modifications were done to it in order to prevent crashes okay so chinese regulator when it comes to the airlines is very strict like how we have our dgca who is a regulator for civil aviation the chinese regulator is extremely strict when it comes to civil aviation okay how are the 737 800 that crash now does not have the same equipment that led to 737 max crashes more than 3 years ago now why did the 737 max crash the latest boeing 737 model is equipped with the 737 max model was equipped with maneuvering characteristics augmentation system which is responsible for pushing the aircraft's nose when it senses a high angle of attack that may lead to an aircraft stall see once the aircraft takes off let's say this is the aircraft so in case the aircraft goes a little too steep it becomes a little too steep like this okay the aircraft itself or this particular software which is known as the maneuvering characteristics augmentation system mcas it will sense that this aircraft is going to a stall stall means a position like this from which the aircraft won't be able to recover and it might crash okay if it is going into a stall it will start pushing the nose of this aircraft down okay so what will happen the aircraft will automatically balance itself in a horizontal manner so that is the speciality of this technique if an aircraft's nose is too high okay the plane loses speed and is likely to enter into a stall this position is known as a stall that is a state in which it loses flight and can fall from the sky like a stone the mcas was designed to prevent such an eventuality however you know this mcas because the flights uh, the pilots who were uh, who were on these aircraft didn't understand how this mcas technology was working this mcas technology started pushing the nose down too low and the flights were actually diving downwards they went crashing okay in the case of two crashes mcas falsely misread the plane's angle of attack during the ascent and forced the nose down leading to the crash now what is the director general of civil aviation recently it became a statutory body earlier it was not a statutory body it was an attached body it is a statutory body formed under the aircraft amendment bill 2020 it investigates aviation accidents and incidents maintains all regulations related to aviation and it is also responsible for issuance of licenses okay what are licenses these are these are the different types of licenses like commercial pilot license okay student pilot license etc okay functions of the dgca it registers civil aircraft certifies the aircrafts airports i'm sorry licensing to pilots like what we spoke of aircraft maintenance engineers it also licenses aircraft uh, air traffic controllers flight engineers and all of them it also formulates standards of airworthiness for civil aircraft registered in india and grant of certificates of airworthiness to such aircraft so it is the entity which uh certifies aircrafts if they are fit for flying or not it also con- conducts investigations into incidents and serious incidents involving aircrafts up to 2250 kg and it also takes accident prevention men- measures including formulation of implementation of safety aviation management programs it also takes precautionary programs in order to prevent such incidents from happening it checks the proficiency of the flight crew and other operational personnel such as flight dispatchers and cabin crew even the air hostesses and the flight crew are checked by the dgca and approved by the dgca hence the dgca plays a major role in both the safety as well as the licensing of uh, the civil aviation industry in india okay now moving on and also like what we said please go through all the other functions of the dgca also like regulation of uh, airports okay aircrafts all of that indo pacific should be free of all conflicts says mr morrison now why did this meet happen it happened during the indo australian annual summit india had an has an on, annual summit even with australia like how it has with japan and with russia so during the indo australian annual summit 
Mr. Morrison said this. Developments such as those in Ukraine should never happen in the Indo-Pacific region. Prime Minister Scott Morrison had said. Mr. Morrison spoke of the need for greater cooperation amongst like-minded democracies and urged Prime Minister Narendra Modi to provide leadership within the Quad. In his address, Mr. Modi focused on the Indo-Pacific region and called for appropriate global standards for emerging technologies. All the new technologies need to be regulated properly, according to Prime Minister Modi. Mr. Modi, uh, Mr. Morrison also laid a broad spectrum of the comprehensive strategic partnership between both the countries covering science and technology, defense and critical minerals that are necessary for India's strategic sectors. During the interaction, please remember this MOU was signed. The Kanij Bidesh India Limited, okay, Kanij Bidesh India Limited, which is nothing but the minerals exploration component corporation in India, and Australia's. Uh, this deals with basically uh, mineral exploration in foreign countries, and Australia's. A critical mineral facilitation office signed an MOU to jointly explore lithium in Australia. This will allow India to invest in Australia's critical mineral sector as well as get Australian expertise in the same area. The meeting marked the second bilateral interaction between the Quad members within three days. Why? Because Prime Minister Modi had met the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in Delhi recently. Prime Minister Modi also highlighted the importance of the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement for economic relations between the two countries. Now, what is the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement? It was an advanced form of the Free Trade Agreement. So, India is looking to conclude this Free Trade Agreement with Australia as soon as possible. India and Australia have announced that they are set to conclude an interim trade agreement in March. This was the recent news and a Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement 12 to 18 months afterwards. Now, what is this interim trade agreement? Interim trade agreement will ensure that some of the components of the free trade agreement are implemented in the near term. Okay, and that is why it is called as an interim agreement before a bigger agreement is in play or has been made possible. Okay, so what is a free trade agreement? It is a pact between two or more nations to reduce the barriers to imports and exports between them. Now, these barriers can be tariff or they can also be non-tariff barriers. Tariff barriers means duties such as customs duty, high customs duty, that is a tariff barrier, such as anti-dumping duties, such as countervailing duties. There are so many tariffs. Non-tariff barriers means excessive regulatory checks, sanitary, phytosanitary means huge amount of paperwork, all of these are non-tariff barriers, okay, because these are preventing the trade from happening. Under a free trade policy, goods and services can be bought and sold across the international borders with little or no government tariffs, quotas, subsidies or prohibitions. Usually after a preferential trade agreement, there is a free trade agreement. After a free trade agreement, there is a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement. After that, there is a customs union and after that, there is a common market. Now, the European Union is in this state. It is a customs union, which means that wherever you import items into the European Union, you have the same customs payment. You pay the same amount of customs, even if you are importing it in France or even if you are importing in UK. And then you have a common market, which means that goods produced anywhere in any of the countries can be sold in any of the countries' markets at the same cost. They have market access. Okay, what is the early harvest agreement likely to cover? We spoke about the interim trade agreement, right? So we will see what this early harvest agreement will cover. Now, it, the interim trade agreement or the early harvest trade agreement is used to liberalize tariffs on the trade of certain goods between two countries or trading blocks before a comprehensive free, free trade agreement is concluded, like what we said. The interim agreement will cover most areas of interest for both the countries, including goods, services, rules of origin, sanitary, phytosanitary measures, customs procedures. Currently, the bilateral trade between both the countries is 
12.5 billion dollars in financial year 2021 and has already surpassed the 17.7 billion dollars in the first 10 months of uh, financial year 2022 okay this was because of a covid year that the trade was much lower okay and hence in the financial year 2022 the first 10 months itself it has gone past it india has imported merchandise worth about 12.1 billion dollars from australia in the first 10 months and exported merchandise worth 5.6 billion dollars and that accounts for 17.7 billion dollars key imports from australia include coal gold liquefied natural gas while key exports to the country from india include diesel petrol gems and jewelry please remember what we are importing from australia and what we are exporting to australia okay coal gold and lng is what we are importing australia has also emphasized that the agreement would lead to deeper cooperation between the two countries in critical minerals and rare earth elements which are critical to future industries including renewable energy and electric vehicles now these rare earth elements around uh, 70 to 80% of these rare earth elements are concentrated in chinese hands and china holds a monopoly over their production rare earth metals like lithium you know and uh, because of this china has some sort of a control over these uh, rare earth metal supply chain if india is able to source these uh, rare earths from elsewhere from australia say then it will be a major boost for india no what are the other free trade agreements that india is currently negotiating apart from this comprehensive economic cooperation agreement with australia india is currently in the process of negotiating free trade agreements with uae uk canada eu and israel besides australia okay uh, with uae india has already signed it uh, we spoke about it in one of the previous classes so currently we are still negotiating free trade agreements with uk canada european union israel and australia india is also looking to complete an early, early harvest agreement with uae and the uk in the first half of 2022 this is done okay moving on sorry supreme court for extending deadline for covid relief okay now the supreme court like what i said earlier the supreme court had directed the government saying that it needs to provide a compensation you know for the victims who had died as a result of the covid-19 now the supreme court held that you know the center has to gather enough information from the states on the progress which was made by them in the disbursement of that ex gratia compensation of 50000 also recently so the supreme court has been posing enough pressure on the central government to even check as to how many states are going ahead with the scheme okay now the supreme court earlier in a judgment had directed the national disaster management authority to give guidelines for giving ex gratia assistance to the families of persons who died because of covid-19 which was mandated under section 12 of the disaster management act of 2005 so the supreme court had asked the national disaster management authority in order to do this okay in order to frame a compensatory scheme under section 12 of the disaster management act now uh, and it has been asking the center in order to check the states also if they are implementing this scheme properly or not okay now why is this in the news because the supreme court did not agree with the union government suggestion to set the deadline for filing of claims to 4 weeks saying that it is too short a time 4 weeks is too short the family would need to recover time would need to recover from the death of the person and need to file it afterwards so the bench suggested giving 60 days of time in case of uh, deaths in the future 90 days may be given further it said that if there are any reasons for delay the state government's concern should accept it okay now this money that the okay so let's talk about the scheme itself the scheme that the ndma has 
envisioned it envisions that rupees 50000 has to be paid to the kin means to the near relatives of the people who passed away because of covid covid 19 and these funds are usually paid from the state disaster management funds okay now uh, let it be if it's say tamil nadu it will be pa- it will be given from the uh, tamil nadu state disaster management authorities funds okay like otherwise in the case of delhi it will be given from the delhi disaster management authorities funds with regards to the issue of fake claims okay there are a lot of people who are issuing fake claims under this uh, covid nineteen compensation fund the bench indicated that it might ask the national disaster management authority to conduct a random survey of 5% of the claims in four states which had a wide difference between the number of claims and the recorded deaths now so basically on the paper it says that there are according to the government certificates there are only say 100 deaths but then more than 10000 people are claiming compensation under the scheme currently okay so this is the wide difference between the number of deaths which are reported and the number of claims which are asked uh the court is concerned with instances of fake death certificates being used to claim ex gratia compensation for persons who died of covid-19 infection the deadlines are applicable on claiming ex gratia compensation of 50000 that was approved under the centers disaster management guidelines which is paid to the next of the kin of who died of covid-19 okay also one more thing is that the supreme court had also said that you know even if on the death certificate the even if on the death certificate the cause of death is not given as covid cause of death is not given of as covid it doesn't mean that you know the person can be denied any money or compensation claims just on the basis that on the death certificate covid was not given and some other reason was given for the death because we know that during covid 19 a lot of the state governments and the center did not want to accept some of the deaths as covid related deaths so they were being uh, filed under comorbidities related deaths okay so the supreme court has said that that uh, need not be the case to co- claim compensation funds the states will provide ex- ex- gratia relief from the state disaster response fund like what we spoke it's from the state disaster response fund the disaster the district disaster management authorities will make the disbursement it is the district disaster management authorities who will disburse the funds after documents proving that a covid-19 deaths are death are submitted the claim will be settled within 30 days this is the maximum time period and the amount will be deposited in the aadhar linked bank accounts the district level committees will deal with grievances regarding certification of death and issue amended documents okay so hence on the basis of the supreme court guidelines to national disaster management authority this particular scheme was framed under section 12 of the disaster management act of 2005 okay moving on padma awards for 2022 were given President Ramnath Govind has given the Padma Awards for 2022. Okay, more on the Padma Awards. These awards were introduced in 1954 and not with just independence. Okay, they are given to deserving individuals for exceptional services in sports, arts, social work, civil service, literature, education, public affairs, science and technology, trade and industry, etc. It's very wide-ended. The names of the awardees are announced every year on the Republic Day. There are several rules. okay if some person is the recipient of a lesser degree say for example someone got padma shri now that su- that some person can only be awarded a higher degree of award after about 5 or more years not before that secondly the awards are la- rarely given posthumously but this is not a fixed condition because exceptions can be possible thirdly there ought to be an element of public service it cannot be just given for expertise it should not just be on the basis of excellence in any field but rather it should be on the basis of excellence plus public service fourthly government servants including those who are working in psus are not eligible for these awards please remember these 
the government servants and that is the reason why a lot of IAS officers or IPS officers won't be eligible for these awards. What are the awards? Padma Bhushan, Padma Vibhushan and Padma Shri. Please replace this. Uh, I think uh, there was a misprinting. This should be over here and this should be over here. Padma Vibhushan is for exceptional and distinguished service. It is a second degree honor. Padma Bhushan is for distinguished service of a higher order. It's a third degree honor. And Padma Shri is for distinguished service. It is a fourth degree honor. More on the Padma Vibhushan. It is the third, it is the second highest civilian award given by the Republic of India. Those privileged to get the award are given a citation certificate and a medal which has a lotus flower in the middle and the words Desh Seva. Desh Seva is given only for Padma Vibhushan. And after Bharat Ratna, it is the second highest civilian award. More on the Padma Bhushan. It is the third highest civilian award given to the government of India for those who have contributed to India's reputation in the global scenario. The President of India confers the award in an elaborate ceremony. This we know. I have given the pictures of these Padma Vibhushan, Padma Bhushan medals at the top. Please go through them. Padma Shri is the fourth highest civilian award and it is given in various streams like what we spoke of above. The award is not given, the award is not given any cash but it is, he is given a certificate and a medallion with, with a three leaf flower on one side and a Padma on the other side and Shri written in Devanagari script. The person's name is written over here. Okay. Please see the picture of the different awards and medals. These are given over here. Now, exercise Lamitia. The ninth joint military exercise Lamitia was conducted between the Indian Army and the Seashells Defense Forces. And it is being conducted at Seashells Defense Academy. So, Lamitia is between the Indian Army and the uh, Seashells uh, Army. Okay. And it is a biennial training, training event which has been conducted in Seashells since 2001. Excise Lamitia with Seashells is significant in terms of growing security concerns in the Indian Ocean region. Please understand that this is also in order to secure the Indo-Pacific region. The Indo-Pacific region. The 10 days long joint exercises will include field training exercises, combat discussions, lectures, demonstrations and culminate with two days of validation exercises. Now, what is this Indo-Pacific region? Okay, the Indo-Pacific region like what, uh, you know, it's a, it's a new construct. It is an emerging construct. And uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, during his Shangri-La speech, he had given, you know, the limits of this Indo-Pacific region. He said that it extends from the west coast of India, okay, Konkan coast of India, till the west coast of uh, USA, the Californian coast. Now, also, uh, the USA was one of the first countries to speak about the Indo-Pacific construct. It had ushered Indo-Pacific as a new theater in its national security strategy in 2017. And it renamed the US Pacific Command as the Indo-Pacific Command. It renamed the US Pacific Command as the Indo-Pacific Command. Indo-Pacific in the year 2017 in its national security strategy document. Okay. Now, we understand that Indo-Pacific is becoming more and more important because of the sea lines of uh, trade. Okay. Because of the high amount of natural resources, because of China and its militarization in the region. Okay. And because of the presence of key choke points, you know, because of all of this, the Indo-Pacific region is becoming more and more important. In terms of economic strength of the countries, India and uh, China, which are the growing developing nations. Okay. Now, what is India doing over there in the Indo-Pacific region? India is known as the first responder in, in case of any disaster. 
some of the examples are operation vanilla operation vanilla was given to madagascar in order to provide for disaster management assistance and also mission sagar was done uh, during covid 19 in order to provide all these uh, necessary items to nearby countries also uh, apart from that we have the information fusion center for the indian ocean region the information fusion center for indian ocean region which keeps a track which keeps a surveillance on all the events that are happening in the indian ocean region also apart from this india has the india is a major part of the indian ocean naval symposium okay okay also india has joint uh, military exercises such as the malabar exercises varun exercises and all of them also india has established a separate indo pacific division within the ministry of external affairs okay like you have the middle eastern division like you have the western division you also have the indo pacific division in the uh, ministry of external affairs now also apart from that we have vision sagar which was established by india you have the indo pacific oceans initiative you have vision sagar sagar is nothing but providing security and growth for all in the region s a g a r apart from this you have the indo pacific oceans initiative which focuses on seven key pillars such as maritime security maritime ecology maritime resources etc okay so india is taking up several uh, steps within the indo pacific region in order to safeguard it mm-hmm. now moving on this is the importance we have spoken about the importance of the indo pacific region when we have also spoken about the different operations which are being taken up by india to safeguard the indo pacific now these are the different exercises which are conducted by india these are the army based exercises mitra shakti is between india and sri lanka hand in hand india and china exercise shakti india and france exercise nomadic elephant india and mongolia yuddh abhyas between india and usa surya kiran between india and nepal lamitya between india and seychelles like what we just spoke prabal dost between india and kazakhstan alnaga between india and oman ajaya warrior india and uk sampriti india and bangladesh ashrahin australia and india khanjar india and kyrgyzstan maitri india and thailand vajra prahar between india and the us yuddh abhyas i am sorry for repeating it uh, garuda shakti between india and indonesia dharma guardian between india and japan equivalent between india and maldives winbacks india and vietnam harimau shakti between india and malaysia imbacks india and myanmar and exercise bold kurukshetra india and singapore and these are the aviation exercises that india conducts indra dhanush between india and uk garuda between india and france avia indra indra india and russia ind ra indra exercise red flag india and the us exercise siam bharat india and uh, thailand desert eagle india and uae eastern bridge india and oman okay indian naval exercises are varuna france and india slinex sri lanka and india indra again india and russia it's a tri- it's actually a trilateral exercise it is conducted between the army navy as well as the air force exercise malabar exercise simbex exercise ibzamar all of these are naval exercises exercise konkan between india and britain exercise ausindex australia and india sahyog kaijin between india and japan naseem al bahar india and oman imcor india and myanmar sahyog hoptak india and vietnam indo corpat india and indonesia okay now these are the different exercises please remember them from prelims perspective section 144 of the crpc now section 144 has been imposed in telangana in a district over shivaji statue section 144 of the crpc generally prohibits public gathering it authorizes the executive magistrate who is the executive magistrate he is the dm or when it comes to block level it is the sdm these are the executive magistrates of any state or territory to issue an order to prohibit the assembly of four or more people in an area 
according to the law every member of such unlawful assembly can be booked for engaging in rioting the maximum punishment is for 3 years for violation of section 144 moreover obstructing police from breaking up an unlawful assembly is punishable offense as well so it could be extended i mean uh, obstruction of police can be an other uh, case that can be filed against people section 144 also restricts carrying any sort of weapon in that area where it has been imposed and people can be detained for violating it section 144 is imposed in urgent cases of nuisance or apprehended danger of some event that has potential to cause trouble or damage to human life or property no order under section 144 shall remain in force for more than 2 months okay it can't be there for more than 2 months when the district administration is launching it beyond that state governments can extend it for another 2 months and beyond this it can be extended to for 6 months totally by the state government itself this is the maximum time period it can be withdrawn at any point of time if the situation becomes normal okay it prevents assembly of four or more people okay and all of them can be booked for rioting and the maximum punishment is 3 years apart from that there can be some more additional cases that can be filed against you also the restriction could be imposed in a specific locality or the entire town or the whole state once it is imposed civilians are barred from carrying any weapons like what we said okay okay this section 144 restricts personal liberties of individuals this means the fundamental right of peaceful assembly which is given by article 19 is taken over now we will discuss as to when section 144 was introduced first it was introduced for the first time by britishers in the year 1861 when uh you know the cpc and the crpc was designed for the first time and thereafter it became an important tool to stop all nationalist protests now what is the difference between section 144 and curfew 144 is prohibitory in nature it is to prevent further as- a uh, escalation of issues it restricts public gathering but it does not bar it altogether only people from beyond more than 4 people are prevented from going out and meeting together okay whereas in the case of curfew it can be for individual members or it orders people to stay indoors for a specific period of time so the authorities can impose curfew for a certain period of time okay now this over here it can be taken out after some particular time period while curfew while it is being imposed itself it is imposed for a specific period of time over here even if the section 144 is imposed it can be withdrawn back later on okay now the curfew it prevents people any number of people let it be four people or let it be even one person from stepping outside the house okay one needs a prior approval from the local police for moving out of a curfew these are the differences between curfew curfew is a lot more stringent okay and then lockdown is a lot better because under lockdown police people don't have the permission to arrest anyone whereas when it comes to say section 144 they can arrest people if there are more than four members or if they are carrying any weapons in the case of uh, curfew people can't even go out of the house so these are the differences between the three okay what is exomars the european space agency's exomars mission 2022 has been delayed after the agency suspended all cooperation with russia's roscosmos this was a joint endeavor between esa and the roscosmos and the primary goal was to see if life was ever there on mars it consists of two programs it was launched in 2016 comprises of the trace gas orbiter and the shiaparelli shiaparelli is nothing but an entry and descent and landing demonstrator module the trace gas orbiter's main sub- main objectives are to search for evidence of methane and other trace gases that can be signatures of biological and geological process but then the shiaparelli probe it crashed during its attempt to land on mars this was during the first mission and this was launched in the year 2016 okay while the second mission which comprises of a rover and a surface platform is planned for 2022 and this has been delayed The primary aim of the mission is to check if there has ever been life on Mars and also understand that the history of water on the planet. 
The main goal is to land ESA's rover at a site which has high potential for finding well-preserved organic material, particularly from the history of the planet. But this has been delayed because of Russia's war on Ukraine. Due to warmer temperatures and less snowfall, the strategic Zozilla Pass, which provides a link between Kashmir and Ladakh, uh, and connects Ladakh to the rest of the country, has been thrown open. This was thrown open in 74 days itself, which is a very short span of time in order to reopen. Because during the winters, this particular Zozilla Pass is heavily blocked. If you notice, it is over here. And it provides connectivity between Kashmir Valley and Ladakh. And this is how Ladakh is connected to the rest of India. Also, Zozilla provides, this Zozilla Pass provides all year connectivity between Srinagar and Leh. It is located at more than 11,500 feet. It is located in Dras. Okay, the pass connects Kashmir Valley to its, to its west with Dras and Suru Valleys to the northeast and the Indus Valley further east. It is Kashmir over here, Dras and Suru Valleys over here and Indus Valley. It is to the further east. Indus Valley is to the further east. You can go from here to like that. Okay. In 2018, the Zosilla Tunnel project was launched. It shall be India's longest road tunnel and Asia's longest bi-directional tunnel, which will provide all weather connectivity between Srinagar, Kargil and Leh. Please read about these different, different important mountain passes which are there in India. Please make a note of which state they are in and what are the regions that they are connecting. Okay, the passes that are given over here are more than enough. Please remember all of them. Thank you.